2021 Anglo-American online event. And uh, we'll be alive in uh, Levy again. And uh, I am Juhani Oyala. I am a, a member of the organizing committee and in outside of the FEM, I'm working as a chief geoscientist for Geopool and Orion Resources exploration team. And I hand it to uh, Teresa, please. Uh, as you've seen, we have several interesting talks ahead of us, and each of them accompanied with a short Q&A session. Uh, and you'll be able to ask the, Q the questions through the link in the window, I hope. But since the time is limited, we can't promise to ask all of them. But please don't let this hold you back. So it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the event, Professor Perti Lamberi. Uh, Perti, you are a professor uh, and you are now the Anglo-American Secretary Project Manager and CEO of uh, Anglo-American Secretary Mining OI. You also have a wide technical expertise from exploration, resource characterization, geometallurgy, process design and mining project development and management, including more than 30 years experience from the mining industry and academia. And you've been with Anglo-American since, uh, since 2020 or summer 2020, and you are going to say a few words first to the audience, I understand. Um, and then we will hear you talk uh, or hear your presentation title, Sakati, Anglo-American's Mine of the Future. Um, welcome to the stage, Perti. Good evening, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and welcome to Anglo Online event uh, in the most important uh, European conference around exploration and mining, FEM 2021. As we are starting this conference, uh, world leaders are uh, gathering together in Glasgow in uh, uh, Climate 21, uh, 2021 uh, Summit. Uh, we will hear uh, promises for how to reduce the CO2 emissions and how to reach the targeted uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, important temperatures, uh, temperature, uh, how we can uh, eliminate the temperature rise. Uh, uh, we are also in in mining industry uh, bringing the solution for this. We are the producers of important metals which are needed to enabling this uh, uh, energy transformation. We, we will bring uh, uh, ne needed nickel, cobalt, lithium, platinum group metals, rare earths, graphite, to mention some of those, to uh, enable the technology transfer. However, we need, need, need to do our jobs also, as we are quite big CO2 emission. Uh, we, we generate quite big CO2 emissions. We contribute about 10% of world's uh, energy usage, and therefore we need to also do our job there. Uh, in Anglo-American, we have committed to be carbon neo CO2 neutral by 2040, and by 2030, eight of our operations will uh, reach that milestones. Uh, we have introduced uh, a, uh, a hydrogen trucks uh, that's developed by Anglo-American. Uh, before that, no um, dumpers, mining trucks haven't be, have, have been working with uh, hydrogen. That's now in a test use in Mogalakwena mine. Uh, to produce hydrogen, we have uh, started to, uh, to do that at mine site in Peru with the solar panels. We in Anglo believe that we can tackle the, uh, the uh, environmental impacts and reduce them significantly by technology. Uh, and these are uh, some of the examples of that. Even we are bringing the solutions, we also are criticized quite heavily about our impacts on, on environment and also that our operations are not sustainable in generally in mining industry. And I can understand that criticism. We haven't been doing so great. Our track record is not very good. Uh, 
we need to do our job also in that area because uh, we, I believe strongly that we are the best one who can find solutions to uh, uh, make our industry more sustainable, less uh, energy in, uh, intensive, also uh, less uh, environmental impact uh, causing. If we are not doing ourselves, then the regulators will do it. And unfortunately, that wouldn't be the outcome wouldn't be as good as if we are doing ourselves. I'm with these words, I'm opening this technical session of Anglo-American online event. I'm happy to see that the talks today are uh, covering quite much uh, what uh, are actual, so uh, critical metals, uh, uh, sustainability and circular economy. I hope you enjoy the event. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Berti, for your presentation. And we have a couple of questions about the operation. So, how is it possible to do mining in a protected natura area? Yeah, it's uh, it needs uh, special uh, uh, solutions. With the protected area, you can't uh, have an impact, a significant impact on the Natura 2000 protected species. Therefore, you need to do several te uh, solu technical solutions uh, to uh, be able to operate in that way so that there's are, uh, there are no impact. You saw in the video that we uh, will come in the mi uh, to the m mining with the five kilometer long tunnel and that's why we are not having any uh, structures on Natura 2000 area. We believe that we can do that, uh, however, with the, when the uh, Natura 2000 uh, uh, report is assessed by the authorities, we will see what will be their, their view because uh, the solutions are then, then they, they believe that that can be done in such a way or then there will be a Natura 2000 exemptions required for the, our operations. But we, we strongly believe that we can do uh, uh, operations that there won't be any significant impact for the protected area and the area should be stayed in Natura 2000, not, not to, to take it away from that. Right. And then, uh, sticking on to the other, other questions, uh, what type of environmental footprint Sagatti project will, will have? Uh, we will have a footprint on the mining site uh, uh, as a production area. Uh, we have estimated in, in a uh, transparent way what kind of uh, ecological compensation we should uh, Give, uh, we should contribute, and uh, th that is about six to nine thousand uh, hectare, which is uh, more than twenty times of the area what we actually use there. Uh, and uh, but to say, with the uh, with, in relation to the metal contents we are doing, we are producing, our impacts will be small, as we are underground mine. The ore is high graded, and most uh, quite part of our operations will be underground. So. Uh, as a summary, the footprint will be relatively low, but mining will always have some impacts on the environment. Right, and uh, one more question coming up. Apart from the obvious environmental challenges, what would be the other challenges you are still facing? Uh, Permitting uh, is part of this uh, environment. Uh, per uh, permit is, permitting is, is because that is uh, do we get the permit and how strict the permit is. Otherwise, the ore is very high graded, uh, the location is very good. Uh, and uh, from the mineral pr processing viewpoint, the, it's easy to process in a, in a sustainable way. Uh, and financing for us is, is not an, really an issue. So therefore, I would say that the, the environmental impacts and, uh, and, and then the permitting are, are really the only challenges I, need, I see for our project. Thank you, Berti. I think we stopped questions there and go for the next presentation. It is by Christopher Frey uh, about scala and graphite on Senia, Northern Norway, mining operation, exploration and downstream plants. Uh, Christopher Frey has uh, been working on the natural graphite sector for over 25 years. He has worked all over the world, including China, Z uh, Zimbabwe, Sri Lanka, Mozambique and uh, he's uh, currently general manager for Scarland Graphite AS. So, Christopher, floor is yours.
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christoph Frey. I'm the general manager of Skyland Griffith, Griffith company on Senja, an island in northern Norway. And I want to give you some information on the mining operation, exploration, and the downstream plans at Skyland. Skyland Griffith is a rather old operation. The first Griffith mining happened in 1907. Presently, it's uh, the world highest grade operating flake graphite mine with a feed grade averaging around 28% carbon. And Scarlet is the largest flake graphite producer in Europe. The current production is about 10,000 tons of graphite concentrate. And uh, Scarlet is fully permitted to operate even at 16,000 tons. So we think that even further increases are possible. 90% of the shares of Skyland are held by mineral commodities, a mining company based in Perth, also having mineral sands project in South Africa. It is now planned that the graphite business will be spinned off and in the next few months. And all these graphite activities of MRC will be held and managed by a separate company called Ascent Graphite, which will be based in Norway. On the pictures, you see the flotation plant and also a picture of a vessel loading graphite. It's an ice free harbor all year round. Mining. At Skarland, we have a, a massive ore body which is steeply dipping. The upper section, so above sea level, is mined out, and currently uh, we are mining in the down dip. A new decline was made. Uh, which is now up to, uh, down to the minus 55 meter level. The ore production comes from this decline at present from development drives, but in 2022, we will start with the stoping. And uh, the production at present is around 40,000 tons uh, at 25 to 30% carbon. On the pictures on the upper right, you see a picture of this trail and mountain and in the in the front, you see the entrance of the edit uh, going into the mountain to hit the ore body. And uh, the mining is done conventionally. So we have uh, drilling, blasting, and it's a quite beautiful spot, that's for sure. Exploration there are three different uh, things uh, worth to mention. First thing is that in 2021, we did. Uh, Diamond drilling from the plus 25 meter level. 3,000 meters were drilled, 17 holes, all of them intersecting graphite. In 2022, we will do further diamond drilling from the minus 55 meter level to confirm the continuation of the ore body to the depth. And uh, in parallel, we do exploration of prospective areas close to Skarland. The location is about 15 Ks southeast of Skyland. We did uh, surface mapping and sampling and next now is a high resolution unmanned aerial vehicle, magnetic and electromagnetic survey. Uh, the present uh, uh, resources is around 400,000 tons of graphite, but uh, this is not including the positive results we had from the drilling this year. So as I said before, all the drillings here uh, positive and uh, the carbon content sometimes up to 50%, which is very high for good flake graphite deposits. Mineral commodities uh, also has downstream plants. And uh, the idea is to produce anode material for lithium ion batteries from natural flake graphite. So this is done at present, basically almost only in China. But, uh, comprises various uh, production steps, mining, flotation, drying. Afterwards, the material needs to be micronized and spheronized. It's basically to convert the flakes into round-shaped spherical particles, which then need to be purified, coated, carbonized, and only then it's the ready-made anode material. And MRC and S and Graphite, they plan to produce this anode material in Europe based on Skarland Graphite. It's a staged approach 
for the production and it's based on intensive research to really get the optimized anode material. At present works are done for the definitive feasibility study. Next step then will be a pilot demonstration scale up plant in 2023. And finally, a production plant in a modular design for a final production of about 25,000 tons of inert material. The location will be in a Norwegian industrial area. So the idea is to, to build an integrated Norwegian production chain from the mining to the ready-made anode material. And this all based on green energy. So it's a rather unique concept which has a very low carbon footprint, excellent ASG performance, and it's cost competitive. So we have great interest from various stakeholders. And with uh, this positive statement, I want to finish my presentation. Thank you very much for watching. Bye -bye. Waiting for the questions for Christopher Frey. Okay, I had one question. Christoph, how do you see positioned against the other graphite project running in Scandinavia? Or one should actually really say Fennoscandia? Uh, I think uh, what we can see right now is uh, that the market is getting bigger and bigger. <clears throat> so I think there is so much room for for many of these graphite projects. So I think uh, yeah, it's it's good that there are different projects uh, in the pipeline. And uh, so I, I think you know we're in a situation that uh, I think for at least for the graphite material itself there won't be too much competition because it's just so much demand for additional graphite now, especially with regard to this battery uh, production. Right. And there doesn't seem to be other questions coming, so I hand it to Therese to introduce the next. Uh, Speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> so our next speaker is Jeroen van Gaal um, from Norge uh, Mining PLC Exploration in Southern Norway, defining large titanium, phosphorus, and vanad vanadium resources in the Bjerkreim Sokndal uh, laid intrusion. Uh, Jeroen specialized early in structural geology and metamorphic petrology. After working uh, for the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland, he joined the Mineral Exploration Scene in 2008. And since 2018, his main involvement has been in the development of this resource uh, leading co intrusion complex in southern Norway. So, welcome to the stage, Hirwan. The floor is yours. Am I on at this moment? Yes. Okay, thank you. you. I, I came in a bit late. Um, yeah, I want to present to you and I'll share my screen. Um, I'll do that here. Share. You see my screen now? Yes, we do. Yes, your screen is visible. Okay. Let's see if I can explain this. Okay, I have to go to the top. I will present in the Bergheim project, um, which uh, Norge Mining is carrying out in the southwestern Norway. Uh, to my knowledge, it's one of the biggest or the biggest exploration projects presently being carried out in Norway. And a, a brief uh, introduction to the company. Um, Norgo Mining is a junior exploration company established in 2018 in uh, Great Britain. It has an international board of directors, amongst whom are a few Norwegian people. Um, it is privately owned and uh, 
it has a Norwegian registered subsidiary named Morgan Minerala S and it's got an office in Egersund. And the company has a very strong focus on sustainable development. Um, just to place us in the world, uh, we're working in the southwestern tip of Norway in the Egersund area. Uh, Stavanger is about uh, 70 kilometers to the northeast or to the north. So, and uh, we're concentrating very much on the um, uh, Bergheim Sockendai layered intrusion, which is in these uh, green and red colors. That intruded on the margin of the uh, Rogaland and Norteside complexes in these blue colors. Um, Norga Mining has taken 43 exploration licenses in the area. Uh, it's all the boxes in red in here, mainly in the northern part of the intrusion with a bit in the south as well. And in addition to that, there are some licenses within the Anorthosite complex. Um, here in the north and the center in the south, uh, looking mainly at Elmanite mineralization. And the southern ones are adjacent to the uh, Talnus Elmanite mine, that is one of the biggest uh, uh, titanium producers in the world. Uh, the field work is, uh, or the exploration work, is carried out mainly by SRK Exploration Services in Cardiff. And I'm actually working for SRK. I'm not a uh, Norga Mining uh, employee. Um, the exploration program has fo focused very much on this northern part of the intrusion, um, the Bjergheim Lope, and from there the name, the Bjergheim Project. And if we look in detail at this northern area, we can see that the rocks here define this kilometer size um, fault structure. And in this 3D sketch, we can see it's a synth form branching towards the southeast, about four kilometers step deep and about seven by 20 kilometers. Um, and each of these layers can be followed around this uh, fault structure. So there's very strong lateral continuity in the rocks. Uh, the rocks have a very well-defined stratigraphic sequence. Um, each of these units is defined by a combination of some of these minerals. Um, they are gabbro, norites, uh, some anorthosite, some troctolite uh, in the top, um, charnakized to monsonetic rocks. And the sequence goes from the most primitive to the most evolved, most felsic rocks. Um, we see some repetition of these sequences in the, uh, in the intrusion. This is not a structural repetition, it's a magmatic uh, repetition caused by new influxes of more primitive magma into the magma chamber. Um, in the 1990s, the NGU geologists defined three mineralized zones, zone A, zone B, zone C. And uh, in these mineralized zones, elmanite, apatite, and magnetite, those are the ones here to the right, formed about 25 to 33% of the uh, potential economic uh, minerals. Elmanite, of course, is a, a source of titanium. Apatite is a source of uh, Phosphorus and magnetite contains vanadium. The work carried out by SRK resulted first in the addition of um, this mineralized zone, uh, new zone, which contains similar or slightly higher grades of uh, magnetite and elmanite, but no uh, appetite, so no phosphorus. We've also been able to expand zone C from what originally was the banded lower part of the units to now also uh, include a homogeneous upper part of this uh, stratigraphic unit. So we go from 125 to in places 400 meters of width. And these mineralizations, they occur in the same uh, stratigraphic unit here in this red color. Um, each of these units can be traced all the way around the structure as uh, new zone here is not shown simply because we have not mapped it in detail yet. Zone A, if anything, has been decreased in size because of our work. Uh, we originally defined seven areas of interest 
and we're now concentrating on two of those. Uh, uh, the Oigrai area where the project started, where the three mineralized zones uh, occur in close proximity and have uh, good grades. Uh, we're now also working in the Storknoten area, drilling here into mineralized zone B. In addition, <clears throat> uh, in the Skypeset area occurs a uh, massive to semi-massive magnetite ilmenite uh, mineralization on the margin of this kilometer size um, anorthosite inclusion, which occurs within the uh, layered intrusion, but is not integral part of it. The rocks that we're working with uh, in the layered intrusion, it's um, gabbronorites uh, that contain these three minerals. Um, it's a low grade, high tonnage deposit, and the grades are typically four and a half to six and a half percent TiO2, one and a half to three percent P205, 500 to 900 ppm vanadium oxide. Um, the Skype set works are quite different. As I said, massive to semi massive uh, ilmenite magnetite, and it's a vein type mineralization. And the first hole we drilled into it had in the top 39 meters with. 20, a bit over 20% TiO2 and 2,400 ppm vanadium oxide. That's three to four times higher than in the um, uh, layered intrusion. And that was followed by 135 meters at slightly lower grades uh, and followed again by uh, slightly lower grades again. These are not true thicknesses. We at present don't yet know the exact size or the attitude of the body, but we are. Uh, drilling into it, trying to find out. Uh, briefly, the exploration program it started in 2019 in the spring, channel sampling to test and follow up on the NGU's uh, rock sampling program. And in the fall, we did a helicopter borne ge geophysical survey, uh, magnetic and set temp to cover much of the layered intrusion. And in May 2020, we started drilling. And all of this is done constantly in close communication with stakeholders. Um, some key figures, we have three to five rigs that are actively drilling, of which two are helicopter portable rigs. Um, uh, sorry, one is a helicopter portable rig. We have uh, completed 102 holes, collected 50 kilometers of core, uh, most of which is sent to a lab for chemical analysis. And based on those data, we've been able to uh, define resources in the oil gray and store areas that were published in the beginning of the year. Um, the oil gray area on the northern limb of the structure, we have half indicated, half inferred, 1,550 million tons of resource. It's, it's an enormous volume. Um, the grades, 1.7% P205, almost 5% TiO2 and 0.07% Fe205. Uh, in the Storknoten area on the southern limb of the structure, it's more modest. We have an inferred resource of 240 million tons, uh, slightly higher uh, phosphorus grades, uh, but very similar titanium and vanadium grades. And we have completed the first round of drilling from which we are fairly confident we can increase this by quite a bit uh, downwards and laterally. Um, Norga Mining is presently uh, carrying out a scoping study, looking at all these different aspects uh, of such a project and potential uh, future mining. And at the same time, we are also carrying out infill drilling to progress the resources from inferred to indicated. And we have also started investigating uh, other potential uh, targets um, by reconnaissance and mapping and in some areas, drone-based geophysical surveys in the adjacent license areas, looking mainly at uh, the Elmanite mineralization there. And with that, I uh, conclude this very brief introduction to this very big project. And for more information, I want to point you at uh, the company's homepage. And I thank you for your attention.
So, Jeroen, uh, yes. how is the exploration competition in uh, southern Norway at the moment? Generally getting uh, busier there? Um, if there's more, um, more extensive exploration occurring, you mean? I, I'm not aware oh. of others starting uh, activity in the area but it, it's well possible that there, there are some other uh, licenses taken up in the area, but I am not aware of any uh, active exploration in them. And one more question before moving to the next. Uh, is there any rare earth, uh, rare, min rare minerals, rare earth minerals associated with appetite? Um, the analysis I've seen, it's not something we're concentrating on. Uh, the analysis I've seen that's mainly from NGU work shows that uh, the rare earth element grades are very low in these appetites. So uh, it's not something we are working with, no. Right. Well, time is flying and we're moving to yep. the next uh, presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, it is, thank you, Jeroen. Uh, it is seabed minerals on the Norwegian continental shelf, uh, status by the NPD. And the presenter is Nils Rune Sandstor, Senior Geologist, Norwegian Petroleum Directorate, NPD. Nils Rune has a 15 years experience from the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate and holds master's degree in volcanology from the University of Bergen. He's currently the coordinator of the uh, NPD team dedicated to mapping the potential of seabed minerals on the Norwegian continental shelf. So, Nils Rune, you have the floor on your presentation. Please, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for the introduction. And uh, of course, thank you for inviting the NPD to give a talk here at the Fennuskandian Exploration and Mining Conference. I hope you all can see my screen. Uh, if not, please give me a, a hands up. With that said, I'll dive into the status of the seabed minerals on the Norwegian continental shelf. The Norwegian Subsea Mineral Act came into force 1st of July, 2019. It states that before mineral activity can start, there must be an opening process. And the competency for subsea minerals lies within the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy and the NPD is the expert agency of the ministry. The ministry has initiated the opening process. And this process consists of two parts, the impact assessment and the resource assessment. And on the map here, you see the area of the impact assessment shown in brown color. And the red outline is the outer limit of the Norwegian continental shelf. On the Norwegian continental shelf, there are two types of seabed minerals present. One is the sulfides, which occur along the spreading ridges. And the other is manganese crusts that grow on bare rock. I will go very briefly through these in the following slides. And the third type of seabed minerals, known as nodules, are not proved to be present on the NCS. This is a simplified illustration of sulfide systems seen on this slide. And to be very short, the most important component is the vicinity to a magma chamber and circulation of hot fluids related to this. As a consequence, we find active sulfide deposits related to the North Atlantic spreading ridge. The second type, manganese crusts are deposited by precipitation of oxides and hydroxides from seawater onto clean bare rock. On the Norwegian continental shelf, the manganese crusts occur on sea mounts. And samples has been recovered using ROV equipped with a modified chainsaw and proved crust thicknesses up to 40 centimeter.
Mapping of the deep sea part of the Norwegian continental shelf has been ongoing for more than 20 years. This is shown on the map with sites for plumes in yellow, active and inactive sulfide accumulations, red, green, and sites for manganese crusts. And the, they are mainly discovered by the University of Bergen and the NPD. The NPD has been conducting mapping cruises during the last four years. In 2018 to 2020, we focused on mapping parts of the moon's ridge with AUV, ROV, and coiled tubing. In 2021, that is this year, we continued using AUV and ROV, but now on the less explored Knipovich Ridge. And our mapping cruises are built on using technology like newly developed AUV sensors and testing drilling technology designed for shallower water. And just to give you an example of data that we acquire, here you can see the improved bathymetric resolution for the two sulfide accumulations, Fovne and Gnitahai. on the moon's ridge. This is Fovna, this is Gnitai. This is an active sulfide deposits. This is inactive. I only had six minutes, so I will end my talk with this slide. Summing up that the Subsea Mineral Act is in place. The opening process has been initiated, including assessment study. And further data acquisition and studies will be carried out in order to better understand the geological setting and distribution of the seabed minerals, and of course, make reasonable estimates of the resource potential. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nils uh, That's a really interesting topic that you talked about here. And uh, I have one question for you, Steve, and more is coming in, uh, and this is, if you have, let's say hypothetically, that you might have a calculation that shows that there are economic or very economic deposits down there. Uh, how would you proceed? Uh, what steps must you overcome uh, or, some, or obstacles must you overcome? And uh, you know, is there any substantial technology de development that you need to do before you could actually proceed in um, mining, so to say? Uh, first of all, the, the area must be open for the industry to, to enter uh, this, uh, this area. Uh, and the opening process must uh, perform its uh, assessment studies and uh, uh, resource uh, assessment. Uh, but with that said, I think, um, I think that we, during our four cruises now, have proved that there are uh, resources present on the NCS um, and, uh, and we need more data to be acquired. It's a huge area uh, and uh, we only started acquiring data uh, within this, uh, uh, yeah, within this uh, area. Hmm? Thank you. And then there's another question. Um, what kind of metal grades do you have in the Seamounts? Uh, depends on what you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about the uh, uh, in the manganese crust, you sure have a lot of manganese, but you also have uh, rare earth elements. You have scandium, you have the lithium, dysprosium, and all these kind of uh, metals. Um, but uh, and it, when it comes to sulfides, uh, we have, uh, of course, cobalt, small amounts, but uh, and copper, zinc, iron. Um, yeah, so, so it depends on which part of the of the ridge system, or if you're talking about the Mongolian crust. But uh, in general, I'll just say that we are working with the resource uh, assessment and uh, we are acquiring data. And this will, of course, be made public uh, uh, as soon as possible. And, and it is work in progress. OK, thank you. I think that was the last question. Uh, thanks a lot. And we will move on to our next speaker for the day. Uh, the subject will be the 
GTK Mintech towards a circular economy digitalized research platform. And our speaker is Jauko Nimenen. Uh, he is the head of UNIT, Circular Economy Solutions at the Geological Survey of Finland, which is GTK. Uh, in his current position, he and his team of specialists provide solutions to different areas in circular economy, exploration, geometallurgy, geology, remining, mineral processing and material research. He is an experienced businessman with a versatile background from B2B business development, geology and mining, hotel and restaurant businesses and uh, analytical equipment and automations. That's quite the background. Uh, so welcome to the scene, Jauko. And the floor is yours. I, can, I, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I had some hiccups with the with this Zoom, but now it's, it seems to be working. Thanks for the, the opportunity to have this uh, small presentation about GDK Mint. The, the topic is quite wide. It's uh, our, our journey from this point onwards to, to the uh, digitai, digitalized uh, um, mineral processing pilot plant, which will serve circular economy customers, but also the mining industry as, industry as, a, as a whole. As you can see, please follow us in LinkedIn, Instagram, and in Twitter. We are very active on, on, in, in there. Oops. So a little bit about the strategy behind the, the talk. There are several of these uh, focus areas, and one of those is circular economy and battery minerals is the second, and the, the information solutions and water management are the, the next ones. And I'm, I'm uh, telling a little bit about the circular economy and the, the battery minerals, what we are doing for those areas in order to, to gain our, our expertise and also have the, the, the infrastructure ready for the customers. So sorry, sorry for the very blur picture, but this is the GTK Mintek at the moment in Northern Karelia in, in the city of Outokumpu. As you can see, we have the tailings area back there and the, the old building uh, from eight, mid eighties is uh, in, the, in the front part of the, the picture. Now we have made the decision to refurbish and renew everything. And, and this is the near future picture. So actually, almost as we speak, we got nice funding of close to 20 million euros. And the second one, which we are now trying to apply, which is uh, uh, between 20 and 30 million euros. So with the, the existing money we got, we are going to have the new lab building and also the, the office building, which will have uh, new laboratories for bench scale mineral processing, but also the mineral processing, sorry, the mineral laboratory and an automated uh, chemical lab. In general, circular economy is a very wide concept, but in, in principle, it's the, the, the idea is uh, to get most out of the material we are using and, and keep it in, in use as long as possible, but also to, to find a sustainable uh, way to process the, the materials and now we are, I'm talking especially about uh, the situation at Mintec. And, and of course, uh, that area is, is based on many things, equipment, digitalization, as well as the expertise of the people. Uh, one, one of the key things is the process optimization, which we are, we are doing more or less every time we have customer samples coming to our premises. So this is a not, not, a, not an exhaustive list of the, the uh, investments we have uh, had during the last two, uh, two and a half years. As you can see, the, the list is, even though it's not the full list, it's quite, quite long. So we got uh, new flotation cells um, and then uh, Mintek Robo, which is uh, it, it's coming. Smart tailings facility, it's a research area for tailings and also, uh, tailings and water recycling. And then uh, we got new process automation software for the, uh, uh, for the uh, pilot plant itself and tens of other investments and also recruitments. So this is the near future. This area here is going to be the new process line. 
And this one is the, the new one, which will be opening hopefully within two years from now. And this uh, new, uh, new uh, pilot plant uh, next to the old one, hopefully by the end of 2025. So what do we do then to get more digital, uh, digitized equipment? So we got the new uh, flotation cells. We have uh, the possibility to measure online mass balances. We have froth cameras coming up and different kinds of sensors. And this is, uh, as you can see, it's partially uh, funded by Northern Karelian uh, Union. And the installation was finalized some, uh, some, some time ago. Smart tailings facility is a completely new one. So it's an area where we have lots of all kinds of sensors and measurement points, especially the LIDAR. So we have long, short and long-term uh, um, behavior of the tailings and also the chemical composition of the water, acid, mine drainage, and, and all that kind of things. So many of the uh, research topics. And this is the picture a schematic picture of the fully automized chemical lab. There will be XRF and XD to, to be able to, to serve our customers in a, in a better and quicker way. And this is one of the ideas we have, which is now under construction. So it's a GTK Mintech standard, uh, lots, of, lots of digital steps, including the digital twin in order to, to be able to fulfill the customer requirements now and also in the future. Uh, this is the, the newest equipment we have. It's an online XRF, which has been installed in a, in a sea container. And that is a portable device to do water research at, at the customer site. Hopefully in the future, we will have this also at GTK Mintech. We have done extensive value network uh, discussion with uh, our stakeholders and, and it happened during this year. So this is just the last, last slide of the close to 100 slide presentation. I will not show it completely. So this is a timeline for the investments, our internal investments. So the outcome of all of this is that our aim is to be number one in the world in the field of mineral processing for the mining customers, circular economy customers, di different industries. And that all is, is uh, enabled by the full digitalization and, and, and new recruitments and technology collaborators. So that is uh, actually six minutes right now. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. And if you have any questions, send me an email, contact me using LinkedIn, or please ask the question right now. Thank you. Right, Yoko. Uh, I have a couple of questions popping up here on the online. Yep. Uh, your current customers, where do they come from? Do you service customers outside Fennoscandia and or what type of customer segment you see GDK's new Mintech services? Well, our customer base is very global. Of course, the, the Finland and the Fennoscandian customers are, are, are something which are the, the essence. I mean, they, they are the biggest portion at the moment. It is, um, it's, it's quite not funny, but it's a remarkable thing that once the circular economy became every, every uh, uh, company and every country in, in their ag agenda, at the same time, the number of all kinds of side streams and, and, and the need to process those, it started to increase at the same time. So I, I see the two things. Circular economy materials that is increasing, but battery minerals like graphite, lithium, and, and that kind of things, they are coming. At around the same, same level. The one thing which is very important is the water recycling and uh, how to increase the water recycling rate. That is, that is also something which is uh, in the discussion more or less on a daily basis with our customers. Right. Uh, this is an interesting question. What would be the proportion between operating mines and advanced project versus early exploration projects? How early Mintech type of issues, how early on Mintech type of issues geometallurgy are taken abroad nowadays? Hmm. Well, if I understood it correctly, we serve customers from at very, very early stage. Sometimes the, there is a junior company sending 
couple of bucket bucketfuls of of gravel to do some sieving tests and it will all, all start from that and then we do mineralogy geometallurgy bent scale testing piloting tailings research water recycling research it depends on the state of the of the project itself but we can serve it from the start all the way to the mine closer hopefully i i got it right well, I think so. Uh, <laughs> do you also accept samples of other tailings from other mining areas subject for experiment? This is an interesting question. Do you also accept samples of other tailings from other mining areas? Yes, why not? Mm. Of course, yeah. it, the, 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 the amount of, of the material which is test which will be tested it, it doesn't have to be so much maybe 50 kilos 100 kilos is enough to have the starting phase so we normally start the testing at the bench scale and of course be even before that we have the mineralogy geometallurgy and then we know that how how to tackle the problem in question Good. so please um, go is, ahead and send me an email yeah, and this is actually an interesting question, especially students online. Uh, what competence areas and professionals you are recruiting? Well, that that's not an easy question to ask. We have engineers, we have uh, a geologist, even hydrometallurgist. Then we have a, a artificial intelligence specialist. I would say more or less everything. And now next year. The, the person who has asked that question, please follow our web page because we are going to recruit quite a lot of people next year. Thank you, Joko. I think that's the uh, good point to go forward on the uh, presentations. And the next thank one you. is, uh, thank you, Joko. Uh, critical minerals from tailings at LKAB and the presenter is Ulrika Håkansson, business development manager and project manager for a rare map business area special products, LKAP. Uh, Ulrika has a master's degree in civil engineering from uh, KTH, Kungliga Tekniska Högskolan, Stockholm. Uh, since uh, 2018, she has been a part of the LKB business development team at the special products to explore and expect businesses related to secondary materials at LKAP. Uh, Ulrika, so please, floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. So yes, yeah, I'm Ulrika. Yeah, so I'm Ulrika Okansson, and I'm the project manager for a project called Remap, and representing LKAB and the business area of special products, as I was presented as, uh, and I work there as the business uh, development manager um, since. Uh, about a year ago, uh, LKAB as an iron ore industry has uh, developed a new strategy and that's what we're enforcing right now. And there are three major areas that are a part of this large tra transformation of LKAB. We are going deeper uh, to a, a deeper depth. So we need um, good, uh, um, when it comes to um, uh, security, all that type type of uh, uh, autonomy and uh, electricity uh, will be part of, of that part of the strategy. When it comes to uh, the value chain, we're adding from uh, pellets to the free sponge irons. And it's of course gonna be carbon dioxide free. That's the whole transformation uh, of, the, of the LKAB using a lot of hydrogen technology, of course. The third leg is the extraction of critical minerals from mine waste. And it's, it's all about those secondary materials that we, uh, we have in LKAB. And that's where this project comes into play. Uh, what we can deliver in, in this project, uh, the tailings uh, are, uh, we, we have a lot of tailings, of course. And uh, so we can, it's about 30% of the European use today of uh, rare earth elements. And it's about five times the Swedish need of the of the mineral fertilizers, and it's uh, without cadmium. Our material don't really have any cadmium, so we can have a substantial contribution to the European Union from uh, from a, a, a supply chain 
point of view and as they are uh, classified as critical raw materials for European, we can also supply the import uh, of them. So uh, what we're gonna do, uh, we start uh, with the fresh tailings, both from our mines in Kiruna and Valmeriet. Volume is our friend. Uh, we start with the flotation process, so we can have a transportable and a pros processable uh, concentrate. We use our own uh, infrastructure already in place when it comes to trains, etc., and establish a uh, industrial park close to a harbor where we will do the rest of the productification of this project. And what we're going to do with the appetite concentrate is, uh, is in the hydro plant. That's where the heart of this new development. And we have worked a lot to re reach our product goals. So of course, the phosphoric acid is uh, our main product when it comes to the phosphorus or the appetite. We also uh, get out the rare earth elements, extract those, of course. Uh, it's a commercial gypsum and a fluorine product. So all of these are important for us uh, for this project. Uh, there are two major uh, feed materials that we use in the hydro process. It's the sulfuric acid and it's the ammonia. So the sulfuric acid is, uh, from a cost perspective, we're good to do on our own, and we also get energy from that. And then we, when it comes to the ammonia, it's for the carbon footprint, uh, of course, that we like to produce that ourselves and using hydrogen gas. In the northern parts of Sweden, we have a lot of uh, water power, so we know that we have uh, enough of electricity for this project. So with ammonia, we can produce a ready mineral fertilizer for the European market. market. With a low carbon footprint, it's from a, a tailing source uh, and, it will, and it will also be cadmium free. Uh, moving forward, we, uh, uh, on the critical path, I would say is uh, the permits. We need permits both for, uh, for the two sites in, in the, the mining part of Kiro 9 Malmberg for these type of flotation plants. We also need a permit for the, uh, the industrial park. So the permits are on our critical list for sure. Electricity, we, uh, we think we have that enough uh, for, for this project, or at least this part of the project. And the location is, uh, it, it's gonna be cited next, in the beginning of next year. Uh, when it comes to the technology, we, we're still in, in a pre-study phase. So that's where we are right now. I'm gonna be there. Um, during Q1, 2022 at least. Uh, so then we need to make sure that we have the process in place to make, meet our product goals. We of course follow the market uh, very, very, very close and see what's happening on the European Union side when it comes to regulation, taxonomy, uh, all, all those type of things that could uh, make a premium for our type of product. Um, so that's where we are uh, right now in, in the project. We plan to be up and running about 2027. So that's what we're aiming for right now. We have a project website, so please uh, look at that one and see uh, we follow, uh, follow our progress there. And you can always contact me if you have any further questions. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Ulrika, for this very interesting presentation. Um, I have a few questions for you. Let's see. Uh, yes. If you eventually would become interested in using old waste, what mm -hmm. in general think it is, uh, what would you see as the major problems? Well, uh, if we're using the waste that are already put on the dams, they are of um, uh, the... Um, this, this uh, it's cold. It, it's not warm. So, so that's, <laughs> so, so that's an issue for us to use use that one. And and then it's hard also to use waste from from a dam that is that is in operation. So that, that those are the challenges to uh, to use the, the existing ponds. Um, but let's uh, we, we'd like to make sure that we can do this one 
and then we can start the next phase. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's see, we have uh, more questions for you coming in. Have you applied for any of the permits already? We're, we're just about in, uh, in the first phase of Malmberget, where we're part of a major uh, permit. So uh, for Malmberget, yes. Okay, thank you. And let's see, is your study exclusive and, or done exclusively by your own laboratories or have you con or are you connected to other university conducting research for this? Uh, we, uh, we do have uh, other uh, suppliers, part of it, N not, nothing officially. <laughs> so, uh, so we're on our own uh, officially. Yes. Thank you. And last question, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, considering the economical potential, mm -hmm. how come you have waited so long? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's when we added the value chain and not uh, sticking with the appetite concentrate and moving forward in the value chain with the fertilizers mm -hmm. and getting out the REs, that's when we saw the financial potential of, uh, of our waste material. Okay, thank you. I think that was the last question. Well, then, thanks a lot. We look forward to see the continuation of this very exciting project and to see it become reality. <laughs> all, yeah. all snores. Very soon, <laughs> we hope. I hope so too. <laughs> so, thank you again, and let's move on to our next uh, presentation. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Tom Kearney from Talga AB. Uh, the talk is Natural Graphite, how critical raw materials are enabling Europe's green transition. And Tom has been with Talga for five years, uh, working closely with the exploration, development and feasibility of Talga Vitanki's graphite project. So welcome, Tom. The floor is yours. Hello, my name is Tom Kearney and I'm a project geologist for Talca Group. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about natural graphite and how critical raw materials are enabling Europe's green transition. I'm going to talk a little bit about Europe's challenge, Talca's Vertangi graphite project and our exploration and development strategy. So Europe's green transition is going to require a lot of metals and minerals. I think that's something that we can all agree upon. Um, in Europe, we're currently importing the ma majority of uh, the critical raw materials that are required for this transition. This has uh, resulted in a dependence on supply from sources that do not offer the traceability or human and environmental protections that consumers demand. This is a big problem. Uh, one of the critical raw materials that is currently imported from these sources is natural graphite. Um, natural graphite will be a vital component of sustainable lithium ion batteries as Europe further embraces electric vehicles. But where is Europe going to get this critical natural graphite from? At Talga, we are doing something about this. We're establishing EU production of graphite anode from our unique Swedish Vitangi graphite resources. This production will take place under a vertically integrated model with graphite concentrate produced from a mine and concentrator in Vitangi and with battery anode produced from an anode refinery in Lulio. So why are we working towards this production? Why are we doing this? Well, it's not widely understood, but the, the largest active ingredient uh, of a lithium ion battery is the graphite anode with uh, the average electric car containing between 60 and 100 kilos of graphite anode. When you think about the number of electric vehicles needed in Europe alone, how can we not be sourcing that material ethically and locally? So what is so special about the Vitangi graphite and uh, why is it so perfectly suited for battery anode material? Well, there are multiple properties of the Vitangi graphite that make it so special, but um, the natural flake size uh, that is, is is actually perfectly suited for battery anode material. And um, also the, the resource is nice and homogenous and is in fact the highest grade York classified graphite mineral resource in the world. 
This, amongst other properties, mean that we get exceptional yields, low waste and a small footprint operation compared to other graphite projects around the world. The development of the Vitangi project began when we came to Sweden in 2011 and started building mineral resources. More recently, we have submitted mining concession applications and environmental permit applications for our fab flagship Nunasvara South project, uh, which is planned to supply 19,500 tonnes of anode material per year. We have also submitted mining concession applications for our Niska South and North and Nunasvara North mineral resources. Um, during September this year, we began our second round of trial mining in order to enable bulk customer samples for, for the qualification of our anode products. Our exploration strategy has enabled us to increase the mineral resources in Vitangi consistently over the years. This started at Nunasvara South in 2012, moving to Nunasvara North in 2016 and Niska in 2019. Currently, we are conducting infill drilling between these resources. So far in 2021, we completed a SkyTem survey over the whole entire Fitangi project. This resulted in exceptional uh, definition of the in situ mineralization. You can see from the map on the slide here, this is, um, this is the final processed imaged, image from that SkyTem data. Uh, this this uh, survey was followed by resource expansion and exploration target drilling with more planned during 2022 and 2023. I'm just going to wrap things up with this uh, 3D snapshot of the Fatangi Graphite project as a whole. Uh, what you can see here is the ore reserve from uh, the Nunes Far South detailed feasibility study in yellow and the currently defined York mineral resources in red. You can see here quite clearly that uh, we have only defined some dis discrete areas as uh, mineral resources so far. Finally, the teal cup color represents the exploration target for the project, which currently st stands at uh, 170 to 200 million tons at 20 to 30% graphitic carbon. This, is, uh, this exploration target is based on drilling um, both Talga and historic drilling, uh, trial mining, historic trenching and airborne and ground based EM surveys, as well as uh, good old field mapping and rock chip sampling. Um, I'm showing you this really just to give uh, some indication of the growth potential for this project and how we can really play a big part in the green transition. Thank you for listening and please re reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I was waiting for the questions, but doesn't seem to be popping up yet. But uh, if somebody gets a question, you can always ask Tom later about it. And I'm introducing next uh, speaker and uh, presentation is the Ikari Gold Discovery Central Lapland Greenstone Belt. And this is a rather exciting discovery, uh, basically most uh, significant discovery in the last uh, 30 years in Fennoskandia. And the presenter is Charlie Seabrook, Exploration Manager Rupert Resources. Charlie has uh, 15 years experience in geology and exploration, having completed her PhD at the University of Witwatersrand. Prior joining Rupert, uh, Charlie worked on gold project in West Africa and gold copper project in Central Africa and Australia. Please, uh, Charlie, the floor is yours. My name is Charlie Seabrook and I'm the Exploration Manager for Rupert Resources. I'm going to talk to you today about our new Ikari gold discovery in northern Finland. The Ikari deposit was discovered as part of Rupert's regional exploration program on its existing tenure surrounding the historic Patavara mine. From the start, Rupert was focused on very systematic and disciplined exploration. And several smaller discoveries were made in early days, which, which led to the eventual discovery of, of the much larger Ikari deposit. Rupert's systematic exploration approach follows a process with well-defined stages uh, and as geological knowledge advances, 
um, that information feeds back into earlier stages and the process is repeated. Uh, so in that way, uh, the, the knowledge is built upon and, and, and further advanced. New intercepts or new discoveries are ranked early on and the next exploration stages are prioritized according, according to the ranking. In this way, only the best projects receive the most intense drilling and are advanced to the next stage. This slide shows the location of Rupert Resources exploration permits within the central Lapland greenstone belt. Uh, and you can see that the region hosts a, a series of well mineralized structural trends. Uh, Ikari occurs here at the margin uh, between um, Kitala group rocks in the north and Yonka Kumpu group rocks to the south in, in a sliver of Savakoski group rocks. Uh, Pathavara mine, historic mine to the east, occurs in ultramafic rocks and Agnico Eagles Kitala mine up here in the north in, in Mafix. Zooming in a bit, you can see that the Ikari discovery sits on a very distinct structural extent structural trend that extends eastward through the exploration permits. Uh, it, it occurs in an area that we call area one, um, where you can see that, that we've made several other discoveries in that area. Uh, and it's a zone of um, structurally disrupted sediments, volcanoclastics, carbonaceous shales, and uh, um, mafic intrusives. When Rupert first started exploring in area one, in uh, 2019, uh, there had not been um, any previous exploration, not, not a single surface sample, um, certainly not a drill hole. Uh, the whole area is, is covered by low-lying low -lying ground. Um, <clears throat> it's very, is relatively inaccessible um, and there's, there's virtually no outcrop at all. So following the systematic exploration approach, uh, we, we started off by putting a, a series of broad space, base of till sample lines across the whole area, uh, honing in on structures that looked particularly interesting um, or structures that had, were, appeared to be fertile further along, along trend el elsewhere outside of our permit area. We were very careful in our base of till sampling to ensure that we were really sampling base of the till. That's to say immediately adjacent to the, to the subcropping rock. Um, it was very important to get these samples in the right locations because anything from the till overlying um, could have been transported from, from who knows how many kilometers away and was not considered to be representative at all of, of what was likely to be in the, in the rock underneath. So following some early success from the, from the first uh, base of till lines that we put across area one, um, we got a series of anomalies that were drilled very quickly in 2019 um, and these gave us um, sufficient encouragement to continue with the, with the process. Um, we felt that we were, we were working with an exploration method um, that, was having, that was having good effect. So when, when we infilled a lot of these areas on, on following up on the initial anomalies, um, we, we very quickly detected the Ikari basotil anomaly that you can see down here, uh, down here in this area. Um, and this allowed us to to confidently go ahead and drill, drill first holes into that in, in April 2020. And here is a plan view of, of the block model that we've subsequently drilled out at, at Ikari. Uh, the first hole that we drilled at Ikari was over here, um, hole 38, which uh, the intercept was 54 meters at 1.5 grams per ton gold from 25 meters depth, which was, you know, at, at surface underneath, underneath cover. Uh, the, the transported cover. Hole 38 turned out to be at the western side of the deposit um, and, and initially we, we drilled several holes over here which confirmed to us that there was significant strike potential um, and then subsequently uh, during, during summer and into winter uh, over 2020 to 2021 um, we drilled, we drilled um, a series of holes on, on initially 80 meter space lines um, and then and then infill to, to 40 meter space lines and, and infilling is, is ongoing as well as further extension drilling to the east and to the west and, and of course at depth. In long section you can see that uh, this area in the west outcrops or, or virtually outcrops underneath underneath cover um, and then in the east you can see that this this zone um, is, is barren on top with a, with a series of barren ultramafics. 
So of course, ICARI is quite geologically and structurally complex. Mineralization is hosted by a series of tightly folded and thrusted um, sediments that are interfingered um, within a ultramafic package. The ultramafics are bounded to the south by Kumpu quartzites, and in the north, uh, a carbonaceous shale uh, forms, forms the northern hanging wall contact of the mineralization. And between that is really a, a mineralized corridor where mineralization is, is hosted by sediments, but it's also hosted by uh, complex veining, overprinted vein sets within ultramafics, um, and as well as being cut by and, and mineralization hosted in a, a series of um, narrow breaches uh, that extend uh, through, through the main mineralized zone. To date, we've managed to drill out a resource of 3.95 million ounces at an average grade of 2.5 grams per tonne, and drilling is ongoing to extend this. At the same time, we're also continuing to drill at some of the other prospects that I've mentioned briefly earlier, um, surrounding, surrounding Ikari within our Area 1, um, and some of these look quite promising to become potential satellite, satellite pits to, to support the, the Ikari mill. We have a very busy winter planned with lots of drilling uh, and of course none of it would be possible without the excellent predominantly finished team that we have in place in, in Lapland. Thank you. One. On to you. Thank you very much, Charlie, for that very interesting presentation of this really, um, well, really, I would say unique, but really hot new discovery. So let's see, we have a few questions for you. Uh, do we have Charlie online? Sure, yes, I'm here. Yes, good. Yeah, I didn't see you, so <laughs> that was a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're hiding in the shadows. So uh, we have one question. And um, what are the other elements, Pathfinder's potential impurities in the concentrate associated with in the Ikari? Uh, the the gold mineralization is actually pretty um, pretty unique in that it's it seems to be just gold mineralization unlike other deposits in the region we don't have any arsenic we don't have any cobalt we don't have anything really that that would be called a you know a, an associated element with it however said having said that there are um, there are some pathfinders um, you know the the deposit as a whole is is um, associated with anomalies in in copper uh, molybdenum tellurium antimony um, though those, I suppose, would be the pathfinders that we see in, in some of the base till samples. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Has uh, Rupert Resources utilized hyperspectral imaging, imaging to map alteration zones within the Ikeri discovery? No. <laughs> that was a very short answer. That's great. Okay. <laughs> and in that case, may you, why not? Um, because it hasn't seemed necessary up to now. Um, you know, the drilling's going quite well. We keep drilling gold. Uh, we, we know what we're looking at in terms of the rocks um, and, and enough of the alteration to be able to un understand the, well, what we're looking at in the core. Uh, so uh, I'm sure it would become more interesting as, as we progress, um, particularly from a sort of more academic standpoint, but at the moment, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're drilling, we're drilling a lot of rocks quite quickly and um, yeah, we, we, we're doing enough to be able to keep finding the gold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, and a last question. Um... Uh, I'll just read it aloud. Charlie, perhaps a silly question, but how confident was the exploration team that you'd make a discovery on this ground? It's easy for us others to say now that the old Pachtavara ground was prospective, but did you have more than a good hunch? Um, yes, we did, to be honest. Um, <laughs> we we were all pretty keen to start going west of Pachtavara as soon as we possibly could. Um, and we were waiting for the for the winter access um, to get that base of Tildrick onto the onto the low lying ground there. But we were we were fairly confident uh, that something something would happen. Put it that way. 
<laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. I think that was the last question. So in that case, thanks again, and we look forward to see the continuation. Great. Thanks very much, Therese. <laughs> uh, and now we move on to our next talk, uh, Capella Minerals, focus on the discovery of high-grade gold and copper deposits in Scandinavia. The speaker is Eric Roth, President and CEO, CEO of Capella, Capella Minerals Limited in Canada. Eric is a graduate of the University of Western Australia and a fellow of the OSMIN, and also an economic geologist with over 30 years experience in mineral exploration and project development globally. Recent discovery successes include the Hodmaden gold copper deposit in Turkey with marine Mariana Resources and the Cerro Moro gold silver deposit in Argentina with Extore gold mines. So please, Eric, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so very much, uh, Teresa and Johanny. Thanks for the introduction and also thanks for the invitation to be here. So it's very much appreciated. Um, just to give you a bit of background on Capella, so we are relative newcomers to Scandinavia. So we traditionally have been uh, mostly focused on the Archean of Canada, but uh, in the last couple of years, we've we've uh, uh, essentially we've we've acquired a new portfolio of projects throughout Scandinavia. And if I just go from west to east, I guess basically we start to, in Norway. So we've acquired some very high-grade copper assets in, in former mining districts. One of which is called Lochen, the other one which is called Sholey. Uh, then next door we have in Sweden, we have the Southern Gold Line. Uh, and then, of course, now in Finland, we've just acquired a couple of new um, projects there as well. So, so we do cover quite a few uh, jurisdictions here, and uh, we are basically an exploration company. Most of our projects or all of our projects are, are pre-resource, but the, the plan for the company essentially is to move all those projects through the drill targeting into target uh, uh, generation and then of course into the drilling and discovery phase so um, and in fact the photographs you're looking at here on the on the uh, on the front cover if you like um, these are actually from our copper project in Norway and, and I think one of the things um, that people forget about Scandinavia is just the, the potential that's still there. Um, the photograph on the left is, is an outcrop that runs 2.2% copper at our Sholey project in, in Norway and, 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 and to be honest it's really quite extraordinary to find things like this in this day and age that haven't been drill tested right so um, so we do see a lot of potential and uh, we do feel that obviously they're very good mining jurisdictions to be operating in. Uh, so just in terms of the portfolio overall, as I did mention at the beginning, we are an exploration company, so our projects are still relatively early stage, but we are pushing them through that discovery phase. Uh, I won't talk about the Canadian projects at the moment, other than to say they are in the Archean. Uh, these are high-grade gold projects in iron formation, so we are very familiar with operating in, in Archean and, and, and older terrains. Um, but really, about a year ago, uh, really, the, the situation changed for us uh, dramatically when we acquired from EMX Royalty. We did acquire a, a package of projects that, as I mentioned, the two copper projects in Norway, uh, the one gold project in, uh, in Sweden, and just a couple of months ago, we acquired the first uh, projects in Finland. Um, just in terms of the, uh, the Norwegian copper projects, and I guess on the, uh, on the whole uh, context of, um, you know, where is Europe going to get its, its, uh, its green metals from, all the, all the energy um, you know, these, uh, the copper, all of the elements that it needs to, to grow. Um, you, you know, it's quite extraordinary to find districts like Sholey and Lochen, where these were former mines. They operated literally for hundreds of years until they closed in the 1980s. And, and basically what happened was um, they closed in the 1980s for two reasons. One is they just, well, first of all, copper prices dropped to, you know, unsustainable levels to keep these old underground mines running. But the other thing, of course, that happened in Norway was they, they discovered oil. So people just walked away from these mining projects. And it really is quite extraordinary to have this opportunity where you can actually, um, you know, come into an old mining district like this. Uh, there's fantastic infrastructure in the country in general, but you've got a lot of the old mining infrastructure still there in these projects as well. So, um, so they're very exciting projects for us, uh, these, these Norwegian copper projects. Of course, they're massive sulfide deposits. Um, you know, these are very high grade. They tend not to be too big, but they're very high grade. And of course, that mean, makes it much easier from the permitting perspective uh, in terms of pushing these uh, projects forward. Um, as I mentioned, uh, both of these were mining operations. They closed in the mid 1980s. So Lochen, of course, was the biggest uh, deposit of its type. It was an Ophiolite hosted BMS deposit. They produced about 24 million tonnes of 2.3% copper, 1.9% zinc, um, with gold and silver credits too, and, and still lots of satellite deposits around the old mine to, to still prove up new resources. Similar thing happened at Sholey, where you basically had 
uh, two operating mines, one which was Schillingdahl, the other one which was Scholey. And we have about 20 kilometers of strike of prospective stratigraphy where you see outcrops like you saw on that, uh, that front uh, cover. So, you know, really quite, ex quite, quite e extraordinary potential to grow these deposits um, and basically put the mines back into production again. And, and, and one thing that I should also mention too, because these are old mining districts, um, you know, a lot of the local people had grandfathers that worked in the mines. There's, there's a very strong, um, you know, mining flavor in these districts. So, so we've had a lot of support from, from locals. And of course, uh, you know, from our perspective, we do our thing to make sure that locals are happy with us being there as well too. So, um, but fantastic projects, good opportunity to grow. And I think, uh, you know, a good opportunity to, to basically get some, some copper production coming back again in Europe again. Um, in terms of the Swedish project, Southern Gold Line, uh, and, and I should also mention too, just before I leave the Norwegian projects, these are very large uh, project areas. Uh, Lochen's about 210 square kilometers, Scholey about 240 square kilometers. Um, so we've got lots of ground to test here in terms of looking for new, uh, new discoveries. Um, on the Swedish project, so this is basically uh, in uh, the Southern Gold Line, uh, a relatively early stage project, a large project, it's about 500 square kilometers. Uh, we're just to the south of Barcelli and also Fabiloden and um, also the Svart Leiden deposits. Uh, so this is a belt where we know we've got multi-million ounce uh, discoveries that have been made. And we are basically now just in that process of doing the systematic sweep through there. Uh, of course, for all the people familiar with uh, northern Scandinavian geology and, and exploration, that means a lot of till, uh, bottom of till type drilling. So, so a lot of our work is really focused on, on getting those drill targets defined from that uh, uh, till program. Um, and, and just a, a quick mention on, on, a, on the two projects we've just acquired in August in, in Finland, of course, uh, Central Lapland Greenstone Belt. Uh, you heard about the Ikari discovery just before this talk. Um, you know, there's been a lot of activity in that belt. Uh, so, you know, we're very happy to be sort of part of that process and to apply our exploration skills um, to, to bringing forward hopefully some new discoveries uh, in that part of the world as well too. So, um, and in the introduction, Therese, you did mention uh, hot mud and I will just say that was a, a great discovery. Um, that was in Northeastern Turkey. I think they were at about 400, four and a half million ounces um, now, but of course it's a high grade gold copper deposit. Um, so one of the things I think that's a really important part of the process is that not only do we have a good suite of projects, but we've got a great team behind them as well too. So, um, so just we only have a couple of minutes in the talk, so I, I will suggest that people go to our website for more uh, detailed presentations and things, but I thought I would just show uh, the location of the projects that we've acquired in Finland, of course, as we do have a, a very strong Finnish uh, uh, focus in, in, in this uh, uh, series of talks. Um, so basically where we are is we, we have a, a package of ground we've acquired from Cullen Resources, uh, an exploration license uh, application and also a reservation that sits in the general area of the old uh, Udukumpu's old Satapura mine. Um, it's, it's a relatively early stage project, but really what we're doing now is, of course, pulling all the data we can get together from previous work that's been done in the area. And of course, the, the GDK has been very helpful with that as well, too. Um, and of course, then pushing the exploration programs forward. And I, and I guess over the winter, as we start moving the projects forward, the idea is to, to, to move forward with some of the early uh, exploration work and then, of course, moving on to drilling as we start defining targets. Um, and as, a, as of course, uh, you, you will know, uh, it's obviously a very prospective belt. There's been a lot of good discoveries and, and certainly lots of news coming out of this part of the world. Uh, and we look forward to, uh, to continuing with that uh, tradition. So just, I guess, to, to recap uh, sort of where we are, uh, and just uh, this is, for example, uh, the bottom right there is a photograph. That's the old uh, Astrup shaft at the Lochen mine. I, I did mention uh, in Norway around our copper projects, there's a lot of good mining infrastructure. You've still got the process plants. You've still got a lot of shafts. Um, you know, it, it's a really extraordinary opportunity to be able to pick up uh, exploration claims around former operations like this. And there's great potential to still grow these. As I mentioned, uh, you know, these have been basically inactive. They've been dormant for the last 40 years. Um, so there's great potential to still move these forward. So, uh, just, to, so just to recap uh, sort of what we're doing, we are an exploration stage com uh, company. We are exploring and mining friendly jurisdictions. We have the projects in Canada, which I won't go into. We've got Finland, Norway, and Sweden, of course. We are working towards getting drilling happening on four of those projects, uh, the two in Canada, and also hopefully the two copper projects in Norway. Um, then afterwards, the Swedish project will follow probably next year, and then the Finnish project uh, as well, hopefully next year or, or later. 
Um, and, and so really our, our real focus is the, is the exploration, the discovery, and I guess our sweet spot is that, is the exploration, discovery, defining resources, and then starting those uh, initial mining studies. So, um, so I think a good opportunity for us. And, I, and, and again, I just would like to, to reiterate that uh, Scandinavia has so much un untapped potential. And, uh, and just one of the anecdotes I like to sort of uh, remind people of is that, uh, you know, in Norway, for example, uh, if you talk to anybody who's younger than 40, they don't even remember they actually had copper mines, right? So, so it's just one of these things that, you know, it, we need to sort of re-educate people, remind them that they are mining countries. They've had hundreds and hundreds of years of mining production. And they can certainly, uh, there's certainly potential to add more here. So, so we look forward to, so I'm hoping, uh, Teresa, that in the next, uh, uh, this uh, next uh, FEM 2023, we'll have some drill results to talk about. And that um, is basically where we're heading. So, um, so that, I guess, in a couple of minutes is who we are and where we're going. And uh, I guess if there's any questions, obviously happy to, to take those as well. Thank you, Eric. And uh, sure enough, there are a couple of uh, interesting questions coming up. Uh, how much cobalt potential do you see at uh, Löcken? Yeah, it's actually a very good uh, question, Johanny. We've actually, uh, we haven't historically looked at uh, cobalt values, but uh, some of the projects we've been looking at both at Lochen and in the Sholey district have quite significant cobalt uh, uh, concentrations. So, so I can say it is one of the things that we are, as we reevaluate these districts, it is absolutely one thing that we're looking at. I, I couldn't give you a, um, you know, there's no systematic database throughout the mine, for example, on cobalt values, but certainly the numbers that we have seen suggest it's, it's absolutely something we should be looking at for sure. Right, and then, uh... Are you including uh, the old waste in your projects? So basically tailings uh, at or nearly your mines? Yeah, so, so at Lockland, you still have uh, quite a significant amount of tailings uh, in, a, in, in a lake there. Um, it's, it's something that we will look at for sure, uh, for two reasons. One is it's a, it's a good opportunity to clean up the old tailings, uh, but it's also, um, you know, as you know, uh, these were basically flotation plants. Uh, they produced a copper concentrate. And, and, and obviously that technology as time went by became more efficient, but a lot of those old tailings are still very, um, you know, there's still a lot of very high metal content in those. So we will certainly look at that as well too, particularly in the case of Lochen. Um, Sholey, not so much. A lot of those, might, the old mines have been fully rehabilitated. So it's, uh, there's not much there in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, tailings, uh, but we certainly will do that at uh, Lochen for sure. Right. Uh, there's a little bit sort of, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, political questions. Uh, as I understand this, uh, how are your experience with Sc uh, Scandinavian, well, should we say, fenno scandian governments compared with uh, Canada? Yeah, I think, uh, look, at the end of the day, wherever you go, it's, it's very important to have local people involved. And, and, and certainly our mantra has always been, um, you know, most of what happens on the ground needs to be with local people who, who completely understand the, the, the workings. And, and, and that would be fair to say for anywhere we go in the world, uh, not, just, uh, not just Scandinavia. Um, you know, of course, we bring international experience and international uh, best practice, I would hope, to what we're doing. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, you still do rely on local. Uh, and, and as you'll see, for example, our team in Norway, it's 100% it's Norwegians. Uh, in the case of Sweden, it's a similar thing. And, and, and basically, and we plan to do the same in Finland as well. So, um, so of course, having the local input is absolutely critical to, to making projects work. As you know, if you don't have the social license and if you don't have the, um, you know, if you're not doing the right things to get all your permits, you're not going to get too far. So, so it's, it's obviously something we do recognize. And uh, um, and I think everybody should do it that way, basically. That's right. All right. Uh, I think that's the end of the questions. And thank you, Eric. And we move on to the next speak, which is the keynote by <laughs> keynote by Richard Colfarb. Uh, the Orogenic Gold Model, uh, Commonalities and Contrast with Occurrences in the Central Lapran Greenstone Belt. And uh, Richard Colfarb, uh, is, uh, has received his uh, partner in geology in Bacchanal University, master's in hydrogeology at the University of Nevada, McKay School of Mines, PhD in geology at the University of Colorado. He was a research geologist at the US, Ge uh, US Geological Survey for 36 years, uh, studying on the global metallogeny geology ore deposit in the North American Cold Era. 
emphasis on, on gold, gold deposits in China, geochemical applications to the understanding of all genesis. He's uh, past president of SEG and past uh, chief editor of Mineral Deposito. Uh, he was awarded the silver medal by SEG in 2011, Kutinas Mirnov medal by IAGOD in 2014, and the gold medal by SGA 2021 for his various contributions to economic geology. Presently, Rich is a research professor at the Colorado School of Mines, serves as a technical advisor to Firefox Coal Corporation, and is an independent consultant to the exploration and mining industry. Rich, okay. welcome well, to FEM, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Johanny, and thank you, Johanny and the organizing committee for inviting me to uh, speak today. What I'm going to do is uh, first talk about some of the uh, common features of the orogenic gold model that we see worldwide and that we also see in the central Lapland belt. And then some of the things that are a little different in the central Lapland belt. One thing that strikes you right off when you look at a map of the gold occurrences in the central Lapland belt, and something that I would echo what Eric just said, is the enormous prospectivity of gold for gold in central Lapland. If we look at many orogenic belts in the world, we see their products of one general tectonic regime and parallel series of faults. We look at the Abitibi in Canada, we have parallel breaks. We look at young orogenic deposits, say in the mother load, we have parallel fault systems. Here in central Lapland, we have a early north-south fault system that hosts the uh, Kitla mine or world-class gold. And more recently, we heard from Charlie about the discovery at uh, Ikara. We have the uh, Circa line, which is more an east-west system of thrusts, both Circa and thrust to the south, that have orogenic gold. So we're actually looking at two different gold regimes that are all per perpendicular to each other, which is something we don't see in many other places in the world for this type of deposit, which really enforces the prospectivity that you have here for orogenic gold. Uh, moving onward, well, maybe. Um, okay, um, just quickly, orogenic gold deposits are in metamorphic terrains all over the world. The younger orogenic gold deposits, the Fanaro's orogenic gold deposits, are along the continental margins where young sedimentary terrains have been accreted to the older cratons. The older orogenic gold deposits we know are in the cratons, places such as Western Australia, South and Central Africa, Brazil, interior of uh, Canada, etc. But also in these cratons, we have Paleoproterozoic deposits that form about 2.1 to 1.75 million years ago, such as Homestake in uh, uh, North America, such as the West Africa deposits, and such as those up here in Scandinavia. What's significant about these, and I'll get to these Paleoproterozoic deposits and the significance a little bit, is they form in cratons that are a key in age that broke apart, and then the blocks came back together and closed interior oceans to preserve these paleoproterozoic sutures. And it's these, what are called introverted oceans that may be very important to the prospectivity of the paleoproterozoic. If we look again at the age of orogenic gold, we can see our phanerozoic deposits here. The young deposits that form during accretions onto the margins of the cratons. The older deposits are clustered in late Archean and Paleoproterozoic when we had thermal events, rifting, and formation of our greenstone belts. But if we look at the Paleoproterozoic deposits, whether they're Homestake, whether they're West Africa, or whether they're Scandinavia, we're looking at a number of Archean blocks that have separated and come back together in the Paleoproterozoic, closing what are known as introverted oceans. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit because these introverted, or introverted oceans contain significant organic matter. That organic matter is associated with carbonaceous shales uh, as you go through diagenesis. 
And they're associated with a lot of oceanic pyrite, diagenetic pyrite that forms in these closed and ocean basins and a very prospective source for orogenic gold. We know the key features of orogenic gold associated with major faults. We see that certainly in uh, the central Lapland belt. Uh, we know they're associated with changing stresses. So we have steep fault fill veins and uh, uh, less steep flat extensional veins that sort of uh, flip flop back and forth and form many of these deposits. Whether we're looking at the Kittle mine or Ikari or uh, any of the other deposits here in the central Lapland belt, as we see here in West Africa, also, we look for contacts between different lithologies, phyllites and basalts here. And the gold is associated with the contacts. There's often a spatial association with granites, but not a genetic association. I'll talk about that in a bit. And most of the world's alluvial gold is associated with uh, orogenic deposits. The orogenic gold deposits are associated with green schist face, these rocks. They form anywhere from three to 15 kilometers. Many of these deposits form at eight, 10, 15 kilometers, including those in Finland. And that's very important when you get to the genetic model, and I'll get to that in a little bit. And certainly competent contrast, if you fracture a competent rock and a less competent rock, the mineralization could be in these physical traps or chemical traps. You have a very iron rich rock, such as here in home stake, you sulfidize the iron rich rock and you form your orogenic gold. The model that most of us now accept worldwide for orogenic gold is the metamorphic model. You heat fluids, uh, you heat rocks from the green schist to the amphibolite facies, you break down chlorite, biotite, you release a lot of fluid, you release fluid, and you also break down pyrite to pyrotite at that temperature, and metals that are in pyrites, such as gold, antimony, arsenic, are released into the metamorphic fluid, form your orogenic gold deposits. Most of that is from the breakdown of metamorphic metasedimentary rocks. But recently in Finland, in Pitkin, working with workers at the GTK, have shown that perhaps breakdown of volcanic rocks can also be important in forming these fluids that form orogenic gold deposits. On VMS deposits at point, you metamorphose rocks such as here in the uh, uh, East Africa, we have orogenic gold, we have slightly earlier VMS deposits. We have the same thing here in uh, the central Lapland belt. We have slightly earlier VMS deposits and then we have orogenic gold deposits. If you have gold bearing VMSs and you have a metamorphic model, is that a bonus? Perhaps certain areas don't have VMSs and have orogenic gold, but maybe having the VMSs with gold at a later metamorphose are something important for the formation of orogenic gold and are important in central Lapland. No matter where we go in the world, there is a spatial and rough temporal association between granites and gold. Even in central Lapland, there's still arguments that could the granites be important in forming these gold deposits? Absolutely not. If we look at worldwide patterns, we see granites are associated. They can be pre-gold, syn-gold, post-gold, depending wherever you go. They can be I-type, S-type. There's nothing consistent associated with orogenic gold. The key thing is both magmas and metamorphic fluids are products of orogeny. So they're going to be in the same orogenic belts, but they, they are not a genetic association. In fact, if we look at magmatic gold deposits or any type of magmatic deposit, they tend to form in the upper three, four, five kilometers of the Earth's crust because that's where fluids are mixed from a melt. If you get deeper, maybe at five, six, seven kilometers, if you have a little aqueous fluid in a melt, you get deeper deposits such as porphyry molly deposits or reduced intrusion related gold systems. But below about six, seven kilometers, fluid is miscible in melt. So you're not going to form a magmatic deposit at depth. So you're not going to exile the fluid you need from a granite at eight, 10, 12 kilometers. So granites cannot form orogenic gold deposits. They must be related to the metamorphism of the rocks. 
And what's important is certainly we have subduction and growth of new margins to continents when we form orogenic cold, but there's no one consistent model. Basically, you can have heating due to crustal thickening. You can have slab rollback and extension. You can have ridge subduction and a window to the mantle. You can have plumes, anything that heats crust and metamorphoses it for the first time is gonna form your orogenic coal deposits. There's models that we have elsewhere in the world aren't gonna to apply to central Lapland. We know the fluids are produced during metamorphism, the metals are produced or moved during metamorphism, but one model doesn't fit all. You have to understand the tectonics of your area. And certainly, widespread contact metamorphism, such as Morrentown may be important. Why? The granites heat the rocks. Heat the rocks is another way to create fluid and to create metals. The granites don't have a genetic association, but they're the heat source for the metamorphism. And a lot of people talk about fertile subcontinental lithospheric Mantle is important. Certainly, that doesn't seem important if we look at young metal belts, such as Western North America, Alaska, California. Basically, the gold fields are underlain by oceanic crust and oceanic mantle. There is no enriched continental lithosphere below these deposits. So we know that model doesn't work either. And exploring these days, we're now looking undercover. The prospecting has been done in the past. The easy things have been found. Now we're looking under the ocean, as we just heard earlier this morning. We're looking under regolith, and we're looking under till, and we're finding gold deposits that are not exposed at the surface. And in Finland, as we heard from Charlie and at Ikura, base of till sampling below the till leads to this great greenfields opportunities that we see in Finland. Places like Finland and Newfoundland, which are covered by till, where we're looking to the base of till today, are the new hotspots for global gold rushes. If we look worldwide at orogenic gold, we see patterns like this. Orogenic gold doesn't occur just as a single deposit, but as provinces with dozens and dozens of deposits, and we're just at the first step here in central Lapland of discovery, I would expect 20 years from now, we're gonna have 20 or 30 deposits of various size, perhaps being mined in Finland. We saw this with West Africa. West Australia was producing large open pits by the 1980s. West Africa had one giant deposit of Basi, but now in West Africa, we have many deposits and they're mining at the level of Western Australia. And we could see that in central Lapland in the not too future. Why is West Africa so gold rich? Again, you close these oceans, you have lots of carbonaceous material with lots of pyrite, lots of organic matter that has lots of gold and sulfides. And what does that do? That releases a lot of fluid and gold when you melt metamorphose it, and we have the same potential here in Finland. What about the timing of orogenic cold in uh, Finland? A lot of recent work by Molnar and other workers at uh, uh, GTK have been dating phosphate minerals and coming up with new ages. Actually, the original age is Arrhenium osmium age, uh, Kitla, which is very old. It's a D1 age at Kitla of about 1,910 uh, million years. That's a D1 event. Worldwide, we don't see orogenic gold forming very early during tectonics. It's often a change from compression to a more strike slip that it forms. So this is an anomalous age, but there is a thermal event. The granitoids in uh, the uh, Kitla area also have that age. So there was a thermal event. But we also can't get away before we had the rhenium osmium dating here. Some of the original structural work talked about D3 gold based on field geology. So is Kitla really D1 or could it be D3? There are always some questions with rhenium osmium and it's still hard to know. I think when we do more phosphate dating as GK, GTK is doing, we might better answer this. One thing that is important, if Kitla, the Kitla mine is early, it would have formed at the peak 
of regional metamorphism. And when deposits do this, you don't have a lot of gold veining because all the silica comes out of solution when you have pressure drops, which would have happened as we were uplifting these rocks over tens of millions of years from 1.88 billion, 1.86 billion, then we would have formed a lot of quartz veins. Early on, we have ductal deformation. We don't have a lot of pressure drops and we'll have a more type of sulfidation to form gold deposits. We see that in Brazil and that's meant what we may see at Kitla. We see a lot of sulfidation. We don't see a lot of early quartz veins. We see later brecciation, which may have happened during the uplift. So the early age, may be feasible. We look again at some of the GTK work from Molnar and others though, and we see along the kit, a circle line, we see a whole series of dates coming out now. And I've seen this in many places in the world. As we do this phosphate dating, are these real or not? Do we have tens or at least four or five events forming these gold deposits? What would the sources of fluids be? There's still a lot of questions. The dating techniques are good, but what do they mean geologically? A few final last thoughts. Uh, as Passi Elu has pointed out for a long time, we certainly have anomalous metal associations associated with the Circa Fault system here in uh, uh, Finland. I don't think that's anything significant. There's a lot of ultramafic host rocks. Metals like nickel and cobalt are enriched in the host rocks. So instead of just forming pyrite, nickel and cobalt interact with the sulfur. And we have nickel and cobalt sulfide mineralization. Also a lot of the arsenic goes in. So you may not have a lot of arsenopyrite, but you have a lot of nickel and cobalt due to lithogeochemistry. There are saline fluids perhaps from evaporites out there, but you need a real high temperature and a hell of a lot of salinity to move nickel. More likely it's a reflect of lithogeochemistry at the site of deposition along these uh, lines. Alteration with orogenic gold is sulfide, sericite, uh, uh, sulfide, sericite um, carbonate, but as Passy has pointed out this early alphabetization associated with all these deposits in central Finland, having early alteration that's widespread makes the rocks more competent and rocks fracture more easily. And that may be a good precursor to where the orogenic gold is. And this recent map from GTK on prospectivity, perhaps looking at albite throughout central Lapland is a real key to your exploration. You're gonna find most of the gold that's along the Circa and also along the North-South structures associated with this early alphabetization. Finally, a lot of these deposits in central Finland have late gold associated with tellurides, bismuth, antimony that always looks perigenetically late. Workers like to say these are different ages. There's a later event. But it's hard to believe, we see this worldwide that lightning strikes over and over again many times. Rather more likely, just the next pulse of fluid at that same time interacts with the early sulfides, early pyrite, early arsenopyrite, and that helps reduce the fluids. You reduce fluids, and these metals come out of solution with the next pulse of fluid. It doesn't mean it has to be a total separate event related to a different fluid or a lower temperature. It's just fluid rock interaction. So just to summarize, the uh, potential for orogenic gold is huge in central Lapland. There's two distinct regional systems, which you really don't see in a lot of places. We could have two great belts of potential deposits here in the long run. We already have two one million ounce plus deposits to Kipla and Akara. These are clearly orogenic gold deposits. Early alphabetization may be a key in exploration. Lithological contacts are surely important. It's an immature province, but exploration, hopefully we'll find a lot of uh, more deposits based on what we know worldwide. Uh, There's no big deal having some of these weird anomalies. They reflect the host rocks. I think the ages and genetic models for how these form 
in central Lapland still need to be better understood. But with some of the work from GDK to GTK that's going on now, I think we're moving in the right direction. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for this positive note news about the forecasting in the area. Um, we have uh, one question to start with. Um, can you please clarify if you think that there's no relationship between gold and refertilized SCLM in Archean deposits? And if so, why? I don't think there's a relationship between gold, gold and fertilized lithospheric mantle um, because we see in younger provinces that there is no continental mantle below the oceanic rocks. So we know it's not required, number one. Number two, how do you get, even if you enrich 20, 30, 40 kilometers down the lithosphere, how do you get that gold up? The way to get it up, of course, is with magmas. But if you have magmas with gold with a lot of fluid, that gold isn't gonna come out of the melt till the top of the melt at three, four kilometers depth. And in that case, you're below the levels or you're above the levels so you're gonna form orogenic gold. You might form a porphyry with some gold, you might form epithermal deposits closer to the surface, but you're not gonna have that magma carry that fluid up and get the fluid out of the magma because the fluid is mixable in that magma till you get the pressures that are about at least six, five or shallower kilometer levels. So that's why even if you have enriched lithosphere, it's very hard to get those fluids out of solution from a magma that's rising. Thank you for this uh, that clarification. And another question, uh, is there any key geological similarities between Western Australia and Northern Scandinavia Scandinavian region for the formation of gold systems in both oh, regions? Absolutely. Um, it's, it, you could say it's an analog. It's the same type of deposit. It's produced in the same way. I, I strongly believe, and I think the majority of us, of us believe, that these are mainly related to, uh, to metamorphic processes within crustal rocks. These are structurally hosted deposits. The structure we see in uh, uh, central Lapland are similar type structures as people like David Groves and Johanni have described in Western Australia. Um, very similar deposits, but the model will be different. It's a metamorphic fluid that's structurally hosted, but every metamorphic belt, every belt has its own uh, local tectonics. What is the thermal engine? How did those belts evolve? And that's where in central Lapland, we, better, we need to better understand the timing of events. If we have multiple ages of events, how does that relate to the metamorphism of the rocks in central Lapland that form different gold deposits 10, 50 million years apart as some of Molnar and the GTK ages show? So we still need to understand the model in central Lapland, but it is the same type of gold deposits formed in broadly the same way as those in Western Australia. Okay, thank you. And uh, th I think that was the last question. Um, now it's time. Thank you again, Richard. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> Um, now it's time for a wrap up, and for this we have invited Jan Sverre Sandstad. Uh, he is a senior geologist in the section for mineral resources in the Geological Survey, Survey of Norway. Um, he received his uh, master in ore geology from the Norwegian Technical University back in 1981, and his main scientific interest includes sediment hosted copper, origin of gold, iron formation, and BMS deposits, as well as the mythology of the Fenneskenden Shield. And I guess that excludes basically not anything or nothing. Uh, but anyhow, Jan Sverre, welcome to the stage. And the word is yours. On behalf of the steering and organizing committees, I would like to close this Anglo-American 
Sakati Mining Oil online event at, at the first day of the 13th Fenus Canyon Exploration and Mining Online event. We will warmly thank keynote speaker Rick Goldfarb and all our speakers for the support in sharing the FEM spirit virtually. Our special thanks go to our sponsors, Anglo-American, Agnico Eagle, and Bulliden. And to our cooperation partner, the Finnish Mining Association, we will also thank CNA for the technical assistance. Special warm thanks go to the FAM project manager, Rita, for as always, keeping us on track when organizing these events. This time, this time the FAM is organized as an online event due to the pandemic situation in spring when we had to make our decisions on how to arrange the event this year. The traveling condition, especially across countries, were still uncertain then. However, we hope that the brief presentation on these online events have and will show what's hot in Fenoscandia. Today, we have heard that Fenoscandia is well prepared for the green transition with great potential for several critical and important metals and minerals in this respect, including nickel, copper, red earths, graphite, vanadium, as etc. And additionally, presentation of the ICARI and new world-class gold discovery, Norwegian seabed minerals and Mintech, GTK's research platform, are showing that the Fenoscandian exploration and mining community are frontrunners in many aspects. We plan to be back physically with FEM 2023 in Levy and are looking forward to seeing you all in person then. Then there will also be, as usual, with trade show, short courses, excursions, as well as the award ceremony. And then we hope you all will join us in the coming two days on the Agnico Eagle Bullying and Student Online Events. Today, more than 600 persons have followed the event. Thanks to all of you for now, and have a great day, evening or night. Thank you.